there's a lot of hatred toward fat people in our society. Um, I'm sure it's the same where you are. It's pretty much like that around the world. Uh, and there's a, like this reputation, this, yes, that, yeah. that overweight people are lazy or, you yeah. know, that they don't, don't work care hard or something or that they're not smart. And yeah. none of that was true. Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for all those people watching us from around the world, Prince George in, K in BC, British Columbia, is a beautiful province in uh, Canada. And we are about 500 miles north of Vancouver, or for our European friends, about 800 kilometers, which puts us physically in the center of British Columbia, north to south, east to west. Today, we got a very interesting and very an amazing guest, actually, her name is uh, Dr. Joy uh, Bracey, and uh, she is, uh, Dr. Bracey is an adjunct professor of self-awareness on Teacher College, Columbia University, and is the host and creator of the Easy Way Out and a very popular podcast. You mind if I call you Joy? Uh, Joy? Please do. Welcome to the show, Joy. So, Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I'm delighted, and you have an amazing history. But first, let me find out, where are you located physically? I am in New Orleans, Louisiana, right about the middle of the United States, all the way at the bottom. <laughs> and, and it is a beautiful day? It is a beautiful day. We had weather into the 70s today, so we're happy around here. Yeah. Now, yeah. I find you, you, you have an amazing background because uh, you have accomplished amazing things and, and still are doing the same today. And, and so maybe we can start with finding out where are you, where were you born in which region, and then where did you get your training? And then mm -hmm. you spend about 11 years uh, working as pre, uh, president and CEO of an addiction treatment uh, facility. So maybe tell us first about you, where you were born and your education and your background. Sure. So I was born in Texas, uh, in the United States. And uh, I have lived in New Orleans, though, for most of my life. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in counseling and my master's degree of education in counseling. And then I became a licensed professional counselor. So I'm a therapist. And I've spent about 20 years working in the addiction field, including addiction treatment, and then including 11 years as the CEO, almost 12, of a nonprofit addiction treatment and mental health facility. And I also um, teach self-love, self-awareness, and self-healing as a counselor online and in workshops and retreats and um, as an adjunct assistant professor. And um, there, you know, that part of my life is incredible. And as I went on the journey to discover self-love and self-awareness, I found myself needing to address the body part of the mind, body, spirit connection. So um, I did that and I've lost 174 pounds while I have uh, transformed myself spiritually and emotionally, and uh, it's been pretty amazing. It's definitely been an amazing journey, life-changing. Unbelievable. When I read that in your bio uh, that you had lost in excess of 165 pounds, you were yeah. at the time over 300 pounds, and, and so... Did, did your background and, and your studies and, and the counseling of others and helping them then started to put the attention on yourself in terms of what, what do I do about me? And, and mm -hmm. tell us about that because to, to make that type of a step that had that effect 
was life changing in many ways, not just in terms of weight, but also mentally, physically, obviously is an obvious, but mentally in particular, and from who am I, and, and redirecting your whole life likely as a result of it all. That's right. Yeah, so you're, you, put your, you put the nail on the head, as we say, um, you hit the nail on the head when you said uh, that I had to um, put, look at myself um, and think about what is going on with me um, because I had helped others for so long and neglected yeah. myself. Um, and that part is something that is hard for helpers like me to focus on myself. And I also was a single mom raising four children. Um, so paying attention to myself was never on the agenda. Um, no. And also being overweight was, it served a lot of purposes in my life. It gave me a false sense of security and safety in the world. Um, and there were things about it that made it easier for me to accomplish everything that I did. Cause I was like a superstar doing all the things, you know, getting my education and raising my kids and doing everything I was supposed to do. And I was stuffing away all of my feelings using food to cope with everything. So in a lot of ways, my weight really facilitated a lot of my accomplishment. But now, you know, at this age, I was in my late forties and you know, the health consequences were starting to pile up. And like you said, I had to say, well, wait, who am I? Where am I in this um, whole thing? And it's really taken me down this road that I never expected. I, I could have never imagined what life is like now because it, it has completely changed my life. And, um, I, you know, people, there's a lot of hatred toward fat people in our society. Um, I'm sure it's the same where you are. It's pretty much like that around the world. Uh, and there's like this reputation, this, yes, that, yeah. that overweight people are lazy or, you yeah. know, that they don't, don't work care hard or something or that they're not smart. And yeah. none of that was true. Um, so there, but there's a lot of complexities that go into weight management with your feelings, with the biology, the genetics, a lot goes into it. Now, the other part uh, of your life that uh, I, I kind of like to know, we touched on it a little bit because when we started, we had a few hiccups in our little podcast. It doesn't happen very often, but obviously you're very skilled in dealing with it, so am I. And, and our guests that are watching us from around the world will never know. But uh, <laughs> you, you had to change locations because they... they uh, the technical system was not working for us. And then, but when you did that, you had to kind of <laughs> uh, tell two of your children that, uh, hey, mom is changing. So share with us the name of the names of your children and how old they um, are, what they are um, doing. Yeah, so I have four children. Um, they're, I have a 24 year old son who's Tucker and he's a musician. And uh, my 22-year-old daughter, Ellie, is a hotel manager in New Orleans on the historic St. Charles Avenue. And then I have a 20-year-old son who's here with me, Gabriel, and an almost 12-year-old son, Kipling, who's here with me also. Beautiful. And, and so they, most of the family has grown up, but they've always been part of you and around you and then are That's still right. relatively close to you even physically because your daughter they is are. managing one of the hotels in New Orleans. And, uh, They're all so, here still. Yeah, which, which is so critically important as well, right? Because it preoccupied sure. you while you were going through all the things that you did and accomplished all those things and at the same time have the family on your own and bringing them to where they are today. You. Yes usually came in the last and those were all the priorities and so that's right when you started as you already indicated and i know a lot of people that uh, have weight issues i went through a period myself not obviously anywhere near to what you were dealing with but but still not feeling good about myself and feeling uh, you know because it is so critically important that you have that self-confidence 
because that gives you the strength to do other things. So how did you do it? You know, like, uh, and, and, and so A is recognizing it and saying, the time has come, and, and then, what did you do then? That is so important, actually. It's not a small thing. I would say out of everything that I went through, the first step was the hardest one, acknowledging that it was a problem that I had to fix. Um, where I had ignored it for so long and made myself believe that it was okay. Um, I really felt I was into body positivity and I loved my body the way it was. And I did not, you know, I said I will never lose weight again because I had lost weight so many times and gained it back. And I did not want to do that to myself. So the first step of saying, I acknowledge that my weight is a problem and that I'm paying a high price to stay this way was really hard um and important because without that i wouldn't be where i'm at um you you see the other part about it that it is with people is saying that the easiest thing is to lose weight because you've done it so often already that kind of a tongue-in-cheek approach the the (laughs) other part about it is obviously and you know i know and so do many others that do something about it or are not quite there yet and hopefully will watch this this program that we have and the discussion that we have is that you already know as you said earlier uh, once you get to your 40s and beyond then you're reaching the point in life that from a will I be around for my family unless I do something about that? Because the risk of then, uh, you know, your body is not built to carry that much weight and things start going wrong. And then if it goes too far, it goes to areas where we don't want to go to, right? Yeah, things like um, with obesity, you are... um taking off as many as 13 years of your life expectancy um that you're at higher risk for 13 types of cancer you're at higher risk for dying of any cause these were things that were very hard for me to hear and accept as my reality um and you you spoke about my children um my two older children were actually with me on the podcast they did an episode where we talked about they were chubby growing up and they they talked to me about what it was like the way I handled their weight because a lot of parents really struggle they don't know how to handle it when their children are overweight and there were some mistakes that I made and they let me know about it and it's a very vulnerable position for them and also my daughter is still overweight my son too but my daughter is more prominent and making the decision to drastically change my body and leave her behind was a really difficult thing. It felt like I'm saying something is wrong with her. If I have to fix myself, then what about her? Um, And she's not ready to address it. She's a young woman and she's beautiful and vibrant and she doesn't, she's not ready. Um, So that's a whole discussion that we had on the podcast. We went deep with the feelings part. Um, But yeah, you, you said it exactly right also. Losing weight is not the hard part because I've lost more than you weigh, you know, many times, uh, multiple times, Uh, not that much, but add it up, you know, um, 20 pounds, 20 pounds, 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 60 pounds, 80 pounds, you know, over and over. Um, And it's the not regaining it. That's the problem. Because when you lose weight by white knuckling, you know, uh, through the disease of obesity, which makes it where your brain does not want you to lose weight. Your brain right. freaks out and sends in cravings and um, you know, is, tries to hold on to the weight with every tool it has. So it fights against you when you, when you are obese. Um, addressing that was so important. Like going to the medical, I had obesity medicine experts on my podcast because I was trying to figure out how to fix it. So I wanted to know from doctors, like what are my options? What do I do? And But at the same time, I knew that if I didn't fix my emotional dependency on food, that I would regain the weight no matter what the doctors did. If the doctors gave me surgery or medicine, 
I'd still regain the weight because right. I knew that food was how I coped with life's stress. Yeah. Um, so I dug deep on the medical side and on that emotional side because it's so, and as a therapist, you would think I would have already had all the tools I needed to do that, but I didn't. I had to really reach deep and um, go finding answers that I thought the world deserved to hear. I thought if I, a licensed therapist, the doctor of education, I'm going to commit to losing weight once and for all and figure out the emotional and medical parts of it, then that's a journey that I think should be shared. Um, yeah. So that's why I did what I did. I really want to help other people like me. So what did you do? You know, it was not surgery, but then from there on well, in, it had to be the, the key that I'm hearing, and I know it from other things, is that the, the commitment to stick the course, stay the course, and not yes. be dragged into it because now it has become part of your emotions to deal with stress. You, you must have the thing that does not help for that purpose because yeah. you became dependent on it. That's right. I had to figure out new tools, new ways to comfort myself, um, ways to allow myself to, to experience the stress without looking for escape. You know, because that's essentially what it's about. Turning to food for comfort is essentially about trying to escape whatever it is you're feeling that is uncomfortable. Um, you right. don't want to feel that. So you go toward food or some people use alcohol or gambling or shopping or relationships or whatever it might be. For me, food was number one. Um, so there's all of that. But I did use every medical tool that was available to me. So I lost the first hundred pounds exactly using um diet and exercise has been the whole way through and emotional management has been the whole way through that those are the diet exercise and managing my feelings have been present the whole journey yeah um the first hundred pounds i lost using a medication called manjaro it's one of these glp1 weekly injections um and what it did was it manages the hormones that regulate your hunger and your uh, sense of fullness and cravings, things like that. My question um, is, is, is that a chemical of some sort or is it natural or what is it? It's a prescription drug and I know um, they are using it in Canada at, of course, a much better price than we pay down here <laughs> Yeah, I know. Uh, as per usual. But um, there's better access to it in Canada than in the, the United States, from what I understand. Um, it's, a, it's called a GLP-1. That's the class of medication. Um, okay. I'm not sure what that stands for, but it regulates the hormones that are involved in the disease of obesity. Um, the I never heard of that. Hormone, yeah, it's pretty amazing. It was originally developed as a drug to control diabetes. Okay. Um, but what they found is that people were losing weight. So it's similar to Ozempic. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Um, Mount Jaro does what Ozempic does. Ozempic is a slightly more popular, like people have heard of that because it's older, okay. a little older. Mount Jaro ha came in with another component, it managed um, another part. It slows down your digestion so that you feel full for longer, you don't eat as much. Um, and for me, the miracle of that medicine was that it turned off what we call food noise. When you have the disease of obesity, thinking about food takes over your mind. You are right. thinking about, what am I gonna have for breakfast? How much can I eat? Can I have that donut? No, I shouldn't have that donut. That donut looks so good. Oh my God, I want that donut. I shouldn't eat that donut. Um, if you're at a party, like, oh, when are they gonna cut the cake? Can I have two pieces of cake? No, that would be embarrassing. I can only have one piece of cake. Oh my God, how am I gonna only live with one piece of cake? It's like constant chatter yeah. in your brain about food. Yeah. And it's right. it makes it very hard to resist eating, yeah. um, which is what it's designed to do because your brain wants you to, your brain only cares about keeping you alive. It doesn't care about the long-term or your right. overall health. It's not paying attention to any of that. It is only thinking about survival. Yeah. And when you are now obese, your brain here. is thinking, yes, exactly. And your brain is thinking, well, you're obese and you're alive, so we're going to keep you this way. Yeah. And so this medication really re-engineered that. And what happened for me is that when that food noise got turned off like a switch, 
A, I was able to release a lot of the shame that I had built up for being overweight because I really realized that my brain didn't work like thin people's brains. I didn't have that advantage that I was fighting against this unwinnable brain problem because if a medication could just turn that off, then something is going on here that's beyond my control. Right. And you know, also we know that obesity is a genetic chronic disease um, that requires medical management because 95% of people with obesity that lose a significant amount of weight gain it back within five years. Um, that is staggering. Like people don't just, that's without, if they do it without medical intervention, surgery or right. whatever. Right. Um, and then after losing 100 pounds, I did have gastric bypass because of an unrelated issue with my esophagus. Uh, I had something called Barrett's esophagus from lifelong exposure to acid reflux. and um, gastric bypass is the indicated treatment for that if you have a BMI over a certain uh, number. And so I did have that. And so I went ahead and had gastric bypass and that has helped me tremendously also. But I still use the medication because I love the freedom of not having that food noise going on in my brain. I want, I want the opportunity to make decisions about food based on what's good for me, not based on intense cravings. Right. So, so when did you start taking the medicine, the injections of, how did you call it again? Uh, Manjaro. Yeah, Manjaro. So you take that on a daily basis? and It's once a week and you do it yourself. It's with an injection pen, sort of like the EpiPen or something. It's um, not, a, you don't have to like manage it. You just poke it to your belly and press a button and it gives you a quick injection. So is that one of those, because a lot of people would want to know that they are afraid of it or this. It's basically, yeah. it's a short needle, I presume. Yeah. And, and very uh, short. yeah, very short. Uh, and, and simply the way it works is that uh, I'm imagining this where you adjust the amount uh, uh, two or three out of four, and that will give you the doses that you need. And you just hold it against your, uh, and then you push the button and that's it, it takes that's seconds. That's it, and the, or, they come you... pre you, just, you don't have to select anything. Um, whatever dose you're on is the, the whole pen, so you, put, you uh, hold it against your belly and push the button. It feels at worst like a mosquito bite, and sometimes you don't feel it at all. Um, not so painful. So every, every injection is an individual needle then? Uh, it's yes, not it's the a, one that like you a, can... Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, just for and our... you throw it away and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you get and, them four and, at a time. So you go once a month to refill the prescription. Right. And very yeah. straightforward and, and very... Very easy. And they are actually working on the pill form of this medication oh, um, okay. right now. This medicine is... So another thing that they've found with people on this medication is that people with alcohol dependence are able to drink less or stop drinking. Whoa. So they are also in FDA trials right now to approve it for alcoholism, for the treatment wow. of alcoholism. So, so basically like, what it did then, Joy, is it, the, the chatter, and you described it well, that is going on in this brain that is supporting, except accepted the body as that's what it is. It doesn't make a judgment about later or whatever. It just wants to make sure that the body gets what it needs and the brain tells you, oh, I see this, I want that. And then I go, as you said, to a party and they have cake and I kind of want to, have, the brain says, I, I, one pe when are they going to give the, cut the bread? <laughs> when are they gonna, and I want two pieces. I can't do that because yeah. then, yeah, and, and so constantly it is sending signals off that are not good for you, but will sustain or further increase the body weight. So yes, it exactly. stops that process, right? Which is, which is driving the whole addiction part of it. Okay. Yeah, and it also helps your, it's your reward system. So the dopamine system in your brain, like say you get home from work and your puppy comes and like jumps up on you, you get a dopamine hit from that. Your brain yeah. releases the feel-good yeah. chemicals. Yeah. You know, when you 
finish washing your car or, you know, turn in a good report or something. Um, so what happens with addiction, any addiction, is that your brain starts to withhold the dopamine from the healthy things that you do or from yeah. anything that you do. And right. it releases a lot of dopamine on this addicted substance or process, whether it's gambling, sex, food, heroin, whatever it is. The dopamine, you know, fires off for the addicted process or substance. And that's what's happening with people with obesity also. They're getting, so, they're feeling really good from a cookie more than a normal, like the way that an obese person feels when they eat a donut is different than what a thin person feels. <laughs> yeah. So you started that process. How long did it take then for you to start? Okay, I'm starting to lose weight now. Then last time I stepped on the scale, I'm, I lost five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever it is. How long did it take you? Or when did you see, because the next thing I mentally is saying, the dopamine, if you wish, started to register and say, I like that. I'm, I'm moving down on the scale. So yeah, when did that start true. and how long did it take? That was right away for me. I want to say I lost 12 pounds in the first month, um, which is pretty significant. Um, now, the weight loss didn't, you know, uh, people get frustrated when they get on this medicine. They are hoping they want to get skinny and they want to get skinny yeah. fast. Yeah. And that's not how weight loss works. The scale tends to go up and down sometimes. There's, you know, if you look at the my history, it, you know, it'll go up a couple of pounds and then down. And then, you know, the trajectory is down, but there were stalls that just happens. But what I teach people, cause I also do mindset coaching around weight loss and, um, and other goal setting things, uh, with my clients. What I teach is that you have to fall in love with the process of taking care of yourself right? or whatever goal it is you're trying to reach. You have to fall in love with the day to day of it. Like I love now going to yoga. When I go to yoga class, I count that as a success. It feels good. It feels wonderful. I don't go to yoga because a year from now I might be able to do the split. Right. I think about today. What did I get from this yoga class? I got right. some peace. You know, I got some exercise that felt good for my body. And that's when I go for a walk, same thing, whatever. Or if I eat a healthy meal instead of a fatty one, I think, that was so good for me and that feels so good that I made a healthy choice and I get the reward from the day-to-day -day process versus thinking about the day that I'm going to be a size six, which I am now, but that has to be a secondary thing. When you're obsessed about the end goal, it's not going to sustain you in the day-to-day. -day. And then what happens once you meet that goal? You know, it becomes very hard to stay motivated. So how long, how gradual... And how, so now you started to lose weight. Did you at the same time while you were taking medication, did you then start working out as well? Uh, or, or yeah, so when you're 337 pounds like I was, I, as much as I'm a very active, energetic person, exercise was really painful and difficult. So I yeah. didn't do it much. I never could no. really get in a good routine. But once I got to about when I had lost about 60 pounds, I was um, maybe about 270 pounds. Then I was able to incorporate exercise. So I've been exercising for about a year. Um, I'm a year and a half into this and I've lost about an on average 10 pounds a month. So about two and a half pounds a week. Although, like I said, sometimes it's been a little quicker. Sometimes it's slowed yeah. down a bit. Um, but that, you know, I would tell anyone who's thinking about it to ask their doctor or if, and if their doctor doesn't know, go see an obesity medicine specialist. Those exist and they should be compassionate and understanding about the disease of obesity to get some help. Because I think it's so important to understand the emotional part as a therapist. This is obviously my focus, but I think you can't ignore the medical genetic you know, components, the biological parts of this, you are fighting a really tough battle that exactly. few people win. 
on their own. Exactly. Um, and so I encourage people to, to seek medical help with this problem, for sure. And bad there are people now that I know have given up on it and say, no, it will not happen genetically. Yeah. And they somehow have, proved, have convinced themselves that uh, other people in the family are like that. And so therefore, uh, uh, I have to be too. And then the next things that follow is that how do, good do I feel about myself? Not very. You know, and a lot of times not very, sometimes okay, but most of the times not. Why don't I go to the gym? Well, because everybody's watching me and saying, why is that fat person? Right. You, you know, that's how I, I had that in a sense that, uh, you know, that I wouldn't go to the gym years ago. I've been doing that for 15 years, actually, and I'm quite involved in going to the gym now. But in the beginning, yeah. I, I, and, and I didn't have the self-confidence because I thought everybody was watching me and saying, you know, what's he doing here? And then I didn't know yeah. how to sit on the machines and, you know, and, and so what I did now, and I've been training for about 15 years and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the, uh, I have a trainer because that works for me, uh, you know, because I, my life works on appointments and you have a busy life too. That for me works. And, uh, and then the other part I should mention to you about it is that uh, I've been quite involved in, in bodybuilding and, and physique and, uh, and became, I uh, started, I, I was already in the gym for about uh, six years, seven years, and then I'm 83 now, I will be 84 in November the 1st, actually. Well, you and, look amazing, I never would have well, guessed that. You. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so... And then when I was in the gym for about six years, and uh, then people said, uh, have you ever thought about competing? I said, me? Yeah. And, and so <laughs> then I did that. And, uh, you know, I started to uh, say to my trainer, yeah, maybe we should get ready. And, and so I started to pick up the, the pace on the, the working out and, and started training and competed here, bodybuilding and physique and my age class. And... Uh, you know, that was 55 and older, and I was then already well into my 70s and came in second bodybuilding, third in physique, which uh, qualified me for the provincials and uh, did the same in the provincials that qualified me for the nationals and for the Arnolds. And, and then, wow. uh, you know, uh, and then COVID came and uh, so, uh, and then it kind of slipped, but I still stayed fit. And uh, yeah. now I'm training again to go uh, in 2025 again, go compete uh, at the Nationals and the Arnolds. And then I'm writing That's a amazing. book. I'm writing wow. a book about uh, uh, living young, dying old. That's, I'll show you a picture of it. This is the... I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Yeah. So I get That's it to you. That's my goal. You know, that was the whole point. I wanted to live longer but live well i don't want to be old and you know bound to a chair i want to be old and active <laughs> and that's the point uh, joy so what i said is that it's not about uh, age it's about quality of life and and then uh you know in my research uh, you know i i had quotations from a, a doc that had done a, a number of studies looking at biopsies of 100,000 people. Nobody died of old age. So that's the scary part. And, and then saying the other part that I had a benefit is that my wife is a vegetarian and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm probably 80, 20 right now or closer to 90, 10. And, uh, you know, and I feel good about it. Uh, you know, the, uh, we eat mainly plant-based diets, diets, and I go to the gym, stay healthy, f am very busy, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, have about eight or ten different companies. I'm an author. I've uh, written about four books and... Uh, you know, and then obviously very active in podcasting as well, and then my companies, and uh, I have lots of energy. Now, one of the things that I did is that, I just want to show you one of my books. The first book that I wrote is uh, 
a lot of people said to me, I have such an interesting life, you should write a book about it. So I, writing books is not easy, as you likely yeah. know. And so I I'm wrote this book, book <laughs> Against All Odds. Ah. And, and I'm going to send you copies of these books. I'm going to sign them for you. It's not about how oh. successful John was, but rather all the challenges along the way. And, and then yeah. the other part is that I was born in Holland in 1940. And uh, uh, academically, I was not very successful. I failed grade three and failed grade seven three times. And then uh, they said, what are we going to do with this guy? Do we send him to the medical or the mentally challenged school, or my parents were beautiful people, and or should we get them a trade? And so they decided to send me to a, a, be, become a furniture maker. And so that's what I did. And then, uh, you know, the, and, but another thing that I discovered much later, actually, uh, uh, you know, when in 1997, here in Canada, I walked into a store and I picked up a book and the book's title was Driven to Distraction, written by Dr. Halliwell. And it was about ADHD. And I said, oh my God, that's me. And I wrote in the book in Dutch there, <laughs> I wrote in the book in Dutch, now I finally know who I am. And I wrote it in Dutch because I was ashamed of it. And, and obviously, since that time, when I found out, I found out, I bought the book, when I picked it up in the store, I have no idea why I picked it up, why I, I opened it and read it, uh, Dr. Halliwell, and then it was January 1997 when I picked it up. And I still have the book. Now, Dr. Halliwell, well-known, ADHD, and he has written probably 18 different books. And so the more I studied it uh, on Google initially, uh, you know, about ADHD, the more I found out about it, the more interesting it became. And it appeared then from the information that I found that probably 8% of the population has ADHD. Now, the interesting part about it is that I then, it took me five years before I even talked to our personal doctor about it, who was a friend delivered our two daughters, and I had known him for a long time. And one day I walked into his office and he said, hey, John, why are you here? I said, I think I got ADHD. So we looked at that and studied, yeah, I do. And, and so, and then the more I heard about it, the more I thought about it then, and the more I, in my presentations that I do, I started speaking about it. And then I felt I had to write a book about it. I did that. ADHD Unlocked. Oh, unlocked. Okay. Very popular. I also have ADHD. I love it. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> I call it a superpower. And, and it is. So, I think it's, it's underrated. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm being very vocal about it even. Uh, if, and you cannot imagine, Joy, how often that happens on my uh, podcast where I interact with people and he's saying, I've not even ever talked about it, but I do too, or they will know. I say if it's ADHD now, and, and, but it's interesting, if you have an opportunity, look at my podcast that I did uh, about two or three weeks ago with Dr. Halliwell. Can you imagine oh, going you full got him, circle? Oh, you had him on your show. Yeah, I had him on my show. And, and so... Then we talked about it, and now by now, and it is actually, do you see him here? 203 yeah. is the podcast, Dr. Halliwell. And, and so we talked about it, and I, I by now have called it a superpower. He agrees with me. Then the other part that I have concluded from all the things that I've seen and did and heard about it is saying that the frequency of occurrence, I said to Dr. Halliwell, in my opinion, is more than 20%. He said, no, John, it's 25%. And I say, I agree. And then the other thing that I said is that, but I found a lot of the successful, and the operative here is successful, CEOs, entrepreneurs, are ADHD. And I said, 50%, he said, no, John, 
75 percent i agree with wow. that <laughs> you know that's so, amazing yeah i'm ceo and i can tell you the adhd i think it it is a superpower i love thinking like that it it makes you where you just can go 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 you know so, it, and and so for me it was already i was 57 years old when i found the book and then uh, it took me five years i was already 62 then I walked into my friend the Doc's office and we started discovering, yes, I'm ADHD. And that's when it opened the door for me and all of a sudden things became clear to me. A, the biggest parts of my life was, you know, I always kind of felt like in Holland that I had, I was a happy guy, go lucky, go, go and happy and, and entrepreneurial. But my, young people can be hard on each other. Uh, and so when, uh, you know, with the friends that I had uh, in grade seven that went to college and university, uh, you know, I became a laborer. I'm proud of that today. But then it was not looked at very well. And, uh, and the other part that happened to me is that, uh, and obviously, uh, the Second World War, I was five years old when we were liberated by the Canadian Army, uh, April the 12th, 1945. And, and uh, we saw far too much that we should not have seen and it resulted in PTSD in the inner child. And I don't want to overblame that, but uh, just to kind of give you a bit of a background. And so one of the things that I had is that the Canadian Army made such an impression on me when they liberated us that I knew I would go to the land of my heroes. And I tried to go when I was 17 and my parents wouldn't let me. So I then was drafted into the Dutch Air Force. And then when I was 23, I left uh, Holland and I wanted to start over again to prove, and I wanted to build a lumber mill and I, just to prove to myself that I could do it. And I left Holland with, oh, I left Holland with, uh, I left Holland with one suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, and uh, you know, and uh, and one hundred and fifty dollars. And I was going to go to BC because that's where the timber is. I was going to build sawmills to prove to me, not to anybody else, that I could do it. And so when I came off the bus here, and I can virtually still see the Greyhound station here, I, I had my my suitcase. I had my three books and the two sets of clothes, and I counted my money at least three times, I had $25.47. And, and, uh, and I couldn't speak the language, I didn't have a job, and I didn't know a soul. And, uh, but then a number of years later, already within two years, I was superintendent of one of the larger mills here, and very quickly I, I uh, progressed. And then, but it was not until I discovered that ADHD, and that opened a lot of doors for me. And then I started to, already had quite successful company by then and companies. And uh, everybody would say to me, oh, you're so successful. And I didn't feel that way, you know, until I kind of found ADHD. Then from that point forward, I started to become much more of a keynote presenter all around, talked to younger people in particular, started writing books and, uh, and, and became very, very active in podcasting. And uh, so, and a lot of people say to me today, you say, how can you do all these things? I said, ADHD, that's the reason. <laughs> <You know? laughs> anyway, so it kind of Great. gives you just a bit, bit of my background and uh, history. But, yeah, that's yeah. an amazing story. Amazing life. So just coming back to yours. So now you're going through it. And uh, mm -hmm. so now it became a question of that, as you already indicated, most people that we know, including me, uh, I would say losing weight is one of the easiest things to do because you've done so often already. Uh, you know, but mm -hmm. the key then becomes, how do you stay that? How does it change your life? And what has to change is that you become 
disciplined in terms of knowledgeable about diet and food and what you put into your body. The other part is to stay active physically. And then the other part is resolving your mental uh, approach to it. And what I say a lot of times is not only to young people, but also to other people that are pursuing changing their lives is that you have to become at peace with who you are because you individually, everybody is special. There's only one of you on this earth and, and, and you have to like that person, accept you as being whole and special because we all are. And then from there on in, come, become at peace with who you are and, and the reason that I gave you a bit of my background coming from the war years and then uh, the feeling that I had failed all became important parts to maintain a positive attitude. And what I did not show you here, you maybe saw it, is that although that made me successful, is that the, the foundation is attitude. No matter what happens today, I will swear it'd be a better day tomorrow. The other way is finding my passion and, and give it 120%. And, and then the other one is work ethic. And, uh, and, and I work harder than anybody and, and everything is possible. And I still yeah. practice that today. That's amazing. I love it. And it does take, it takes a, um, and you'll relate to this, I think. Like you have to love yourself to do all that for yourself there you are not going to accomplish all these things um and have that peace within yourself if you don't have self-love and that's where a lot of my the emotional work came in is taking care of myself loving myself liking myself um and a hundred percent the peace comes from my spiritual practice meditation um yoga it's, it's all working together. The exercise, the diet, the emotional health, uh, healing, uh, emotional, like coping in healthy ways, and also the spiritual practice, meditation and yoga and mindfulness. Um, those things are all working together to keep me healthy. And further, they make me sure that I will always take care of myself. This is not, this uh, journey that I went on was not about getting skinny. It was about taking care of myself as best I can. And that's the key, right? So the, the other part about a joy, you find it, I find it, is that so many people, even now, you know, like, I even still now at 83, nearly 84, I usually get up at 5.30 in the morning. I always think I'm late and I always make my bed and I'm always in a hurry and, and I know Whatever day it is, it will be a challenge and I always will like it and enjoy it. So many people yes. don't like their jobs. And, and so mm -hmm. I say change or do something, you know, the, and, and the same with young people when I make presentations to them. A lot of times they, I ask them, so what do you plan for a career? And say, well, I, I don't know. I said, well, my recommendation would be is try out some of the things that you may want to do. You want to be a truck driver? Find out what the truck driver does. You want to be a builder or, or a, a contractor of some sort? F talk to people because they love to talk to you about what they're doing and why they're doing. You want to be a lawyer? Talk to your lawyer, a doctor? Talk to your lawyer. Even an entrepreneur or a businessman? Talk to them because they will. And so, uh, I felt I had to write a book about that, and I wrote this one here, Finding Your Passion, Living the Dream. And, and Love it. so, and I'm gonna send you a copy of this one as well, is that then the fair question would be is, hey John, are you living the dream? I sure am. And, and oh, it yeah. makes, <clears throat> it then completes in saying that, I'm at peace with who I am, you know, they, uh, and, and, and then the other part is the, uh, and, and I, I am living the dream and doing those things and doing other things. And that allows me also to 
going to the gym for a lot of people is not easy. And, and, and what I do is I find a way of how do I stay active? Because if I don't have the right diet, I don't give my, keep my body active and, and, and healthy and then not have a healthy mind, that's not good. We need all those main areas. And uh, so what I do now is I go to the gym and, uh, you know, I still stay active. I have a goal. I have a trainer and uh, I love it. And, uh, you know, and again, I'm going to compete. And uh, even now at 83, I'm the most, uh, uh, the, the oldest active uh, uh, bodybuilder in North America, you know, the competitive That's bodybuilder. Amazing. Well, and that speaks to what I was thinking when you were talking is that you're living the dream, but also you still have dreams. Exactly. Like, yeah, I'm living the dream too. And I have so many dreams still, you know, that you keep on working toward these things that these little songs in your heart that, you know, might be very deep. You have to find what calls you, what are you called to do and keep growing in it keep feeling your way through and uh never say oh i'm done you know i'm not gonna like how i had given up on my body you can't give up on yourself like that you can't say oh i'm done i've done all the things now i'm just gonna rest you know you can but if you want an energetic life if you want to live the dream then you got to keep having dreams yeah and at the same time uh, you know that uh, you know that the last decade of your life are likely the most important one. Hopefully it will be later the last decade rather than earlier is what can you do to make it happen for you and to keep you motivated and making you feel fit because so easy for so many people that I know you say, well, I'm too, I'm too old. I, I cannot do that. Or I cannot do this. That's why I have my book against all odds. If I can do it, Anybody can do it. It's motivation, and it is the combination of all three, feeling in, in, at peace with who you are, in love with who you are, and then at the same time saying that staying fit is that, uh, you know, having, getting that exercise, and, uh, and diet is so critically, critically important, and understanding it, uh, you know, like, uh, so, Let's talk about that a little bit more because that is so important for people that are listening to us. So you gain the, the 100 pounds and, and by medication, you want to physically become more active and, and then mm -hmm. staying positive about it because now you know that you can do it. And so then you want another 65 pounds after that or 70 pounds after that. So yeah. Yeah, and the, the thing is to not, the time is going to pass whether you are losing weight or not. Exactly. So focusing on, oh, but it'll take me forever. You know, it, it took me a year and a half to lose the weight. Today, my doctor said, you don't need to lose any more weight. And no. that to me is a miracle in my life. If I, just like you said, if I can do that, anyone can do that because I never thought that I would be where I'm at now. I never thought it was possible. So what do you do about diet, uh, Joy, in yep. terms of, uh, so you know, because I'm have... being very, very conscientious of diet. Yes. So is my wife. Oh, it is yeah. very important. I, um, well, I don't eat beef or pork. That's unrelated to the weight loss, although I think it helps. Um, I don't either. I only eat, yeah, I eat uh, chicken and turkey. Um, and fish and yeah, fish. Oh yeah, down in New Orleans, we are known for our seafood. Yeah. I have lots. Of seafood so you do exactly the same as um, that we are doing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so only um, yeah, poultry and and um, seafood. And what I do is I focus on getting enough protein throughout the day. I would say that yeah. is my main goal. I do. Um, only eat sugar in certain circumstances. Like, um, if it's, I don't ever go out and buy sugar, sugary foods, I'll eat it. You know, I'm not going to restrict completely. Um, because for me, I feel like if I say I'm never going to have a donut ever again in my life, that is not going to lead me down a good road. Then, you know, no. you get to panicky and, you know, not feel like you're enjoying life. 
Um, yeah. And in New Orleans, we have very good food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't restrict, although I, on a day to day basis, eat very little sugar. I use right. um, stevia and monk fruit to sweeten things if they need to be sweetened. Um, but the main thing is that I count the protein grams that I eat every day. And there's, you know, you can Google how much protein should I eat and get the number um, and right. then track it throughout the day. And what I have found is that if you are focused on that, you don't have enough room to be eating bread and all that. Like if I look at, um, you know, for example, tonight I brought home a pizza for my sons. I cannot, I'm not going to eat pizza because there's a lot of bread and all that, but pizza yeah. is delicious. So I also got myself a rotisserie chicken. Um, I don't know if y'all can do that, but we could just buy a cooked yeah, yeah. chicken at the grocery store. Very healthy, yeah, delicious. Too. Yeah. I'm going to take a little cheese from on top of the pizza and put that on my chicken. Yeah. Because that'll give me, it's, you know, there's no vegetables there. So I have to make sure for breakfast that I get a good smoothie or something. But, you know, I will still feel like I'm eating pizza, but I'm getting the protein that I need because I don't have space in my stomach for the bread that goes with pizza. And so that's what I find focusing on the protein and focusing on, um, what you add. So I have, I follow this nutritionist and she says nutrition by addition, eat what you want and add what you need. So for example, yeah. let's pretend I'm craving potato chips. Yeah. I can't go into the kitchen and open the bag of chips and start eating because before you know it, you've eaten 400 calories worth of chips. Yeah. But what you can do is build a healthy meal around potato chips. So you can say, okay, I'm going to eat some potato chips. With this, I'm going to have on my plate a chicken breast and some carrots and broccoli to dip in some dip so that yeah. I'm getting the fiber and the protein that I need and maybe a, a slice of avocado to get some healthy fats so that I have a fully satisfying, balanced meal. And then you eat a very small amount of chips, but you had your chips. You don't feel yeah. deprived. Yeah. So I always eat what I want and add what I need. So like tonight, I need the chicken. I want some of the topping of the pizza. So I'm going to yeah. add that to my chicken. Yeah. So, so that's so, how. That's what I. And so, what do you for, do for breakfast? Most of the time, my breakfast is either Greek yogurt or scrambled eggs. Um, sometimes I'll eat an apple or a banana with peanut butter. Um, or a smoothie. I make uh, chocolate smoothies with cottage cheese. I know that sounds weird, but um, yeah. I use chocolate protein powder with uh, cottage cheese and high protein milk, like a uh, vegan high protein milk, yeah. um, so that it's a high protein and filling uh, chocolatey drink. <laughs> yeah. And then for lunch, I prepare, I'll eat like turkey breast with um, carrots or grapes or something with fiber. And right. Um, nuts, cheese, lots of times I just eat like that. Nuts, cheese, um, protein. And then for dinner, I almost eat what any, anyone else would eat. I just focus on the protein first, um, right. and foremost. Right. Yeah. So I end up eating low carb, but I'm not on a low carb diet, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Because I but, feel but, like that mentally is taxing on a person. Yeah. Feeling like I can't eat this, I can't eat that, I no. don't eat this, I don't eat that. Is no, no you good. carefully I say, oh, well, consider it though. You know what? what yeah, you I do, and I like what I eat, and your body craves what you give it. Yeah. So I cr like right now. I'm hungry for my dinner. I can't wait for my rotisserie chicken. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm not yeah. thinking about ice cream or donuts or cupcakes because no. I don't eat those things. My body no. is craving what I give it, which is high protein lean meat so we all get a trigger of some sort that happens a wake-up call so it was in 2008 i got a case of diverticulitis and it was a rupture in my colon as you likely know and and it can be it can kill you uh, because the toxins attack your healthy organs and I got an operation just in time, actually, and I came that close, you know. So after that, I started 
My wife has always been very more disciplined than I've been in diets. So I started listening closer to her and, and gradually then staying, changed my life. Uh, part of it was going to the gym and, uh, you know, with the trainer. And then the other part is looking at the food that I was eating. And uh, so now what we're doing is that uh, she is obviously vegan and then I'm 90, 10 or 80, 20 is that uh, I don't do uh, pork or meat. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, chicken and fish. And then the other part is that I do most of the shopping and I go into the store, but usually on the outside of the store uh, inside because I don't want any processed foods. And, and it's all plant-based or not processed food. So we fairly care, and I do all the shopping for that, and uh, she trusts me enough that she knows what I will buy, and I eat what yeah. she eats, and then uh, uh, we are, have a place in Victoria, so that's down south. I spend the weekends there. During the week, I'm up here in northern BC, but still I'm very careful about my diets, do a lot of uh, salads, and uh, but still always thinking in terms of mental health, physical health, and diet. And, and, yeah, and so your uh, body is what you feed it is with weight loss. It's like 80% what you eat. The workout is important for your mental health and for your cardiovascular health. But as far as your weight goes, the, the exercise doesn't make that much of a difference. Cause if you think you might burn 200 calories on a treadmill, it takes nothing. I mean, one, you know, two pieces of candy and this 200 calories. So you're not, the exercise is not as important to weight loss as it is to your mental health and your cardiovascular health. And I also agree. I, I try to eat very little that comes from a box yeah, or a bag. You know, you want to eat things that come on the, I love that around the outside of the aisle. Oh, I'm going upside down. Yeah. No, that's okay. You can, you can change it. It's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so can you change it or? I don't know. Um, I didn't touch it. So yeah, there you go. I did that. Oh, so weird. Yeah. Okay, there you have. Yes. I have you back there. So, Joy, <laughs> we are reaching the end of our podcast here. So, if we look around us, and obviously, you're an amazing individual in terms of the career that you had, the family that you have uh, all around you the pride that you have in the things that you did, and then coming from 335 pounds where virtually everybody would have said, well, it's not possible, uh, just accept yeah. who you are, and you said no. And, and so yes. you then found out uh, you know, that to trigger some of the emotional parts about food uh, by... Uh, injections or by medicine can you m mention it once more to us but you used uh, the name it was called manjaro m-o-u-n-j-a-r-o so that then stopped you the urge on the mental thought of this going on in your brain and it then allowed you to introduce discipline and gradually look at food a different way as you did before. And gradually, as you then saw reducing 10, 12 pounds a month, something that anybody would say, that's no, not possible, but well, you did. And within a year and a half, you had lost 165 pounds to where you are yes. now, half of that. And where right. the doc is now saying, Hey, Joy, to be, stay where you are because you're just right. You feel good. Now, that sends to me the signal to a lot of people that I know that have given up virtually at the ages, or in some cases, 40, 50s, as to where they are reaching that critical point in life is that yeah. it cannot be done is say, yes, it can and you are yes, a proven example of it, uh, you know, and, and it changes, you, uh, obviously in your case, it changed your life, 
but you had a lot of positive elements that you already uh, had in, as an individual. You had the strength to do it and the willpower to do it once you saw the tools and, uh, and saying to all the people that are watching us that even there, looking at an individual like me with ADHD, thought that he failed and could not do it, and I say, I can. And, I, and, and then from there on in, success will follow. It's not about money. It's not about that. It's about long levity. It's about feeling good and, and being that peace around the people that are around you and, and feeling good about what they can also do and uh, by being an example. And uh, it has been amazing. And uh, do you have a website, uh, Joy, that we can... I do. Yeah, so um, anyone can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at D-R-J-O-Y-B-R-A-C-E-Y, Dr. Joy Bracey. And that's where they can find my self-love and self-healing and self-awareness content and some about my weight loss. And then um, my website is drjoybracey.com, D-R-J-O-Y-B-R-A-C-E-Y. Um, and anyone can find me there too. And then the, 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 and the, the, podca the, podcast. the podcast is very, ha uh, give us your podcast. Yeah. So the podcast is anywhere you listen to podcasts and it's called The Easy Way Out with Dr. Joy Bracey. And it's way spelled W-E-I-G-H, The Easy Way Out. The Easy Way Out. Um, I highly recommend it for anyone struggling with unhealthy coping of any kind, um, not just food, but so I really go deep into the emotional and biological undertones of addiction and uh, coping with life without turning to a harmful substance or process. Joy, it was an amazing podcast. We focused a lot on weight in particular. Obviously, I have to have another podcast with you at some point, or maybe at some point you want to invite me on your podcast and we will play it on ours. And you can sure. interact with Scott about that. I will sign the books for you and send them to you. This one here is not coming out until August. I'm working on that as we speak. And, uh, I love you know, it. But I will get you copies of the book. I will sign them to you. Now, the other thing we saw a podcast, they will come out the following day. This one will come out tomorrow morning. Yeah, it will come out tomorrow morning. It will be available to you. We leave, safe and except for the intro, we started over again. Uh, you know, but in, any of the small little things in there, we leave it all the way it is. And, uh, uh, you know, we do very little editing on it. Uh, and the only time that we really change that other than the one little hiccup that we had uh, here is at one point, uh, it must be about a year ago, all of a sudden I did the introduction and the whole building started shaking and, and it was a <gasps> 4.6 earthquake. And I said, oh my God, it's a, you know, but we left that even in the, in the podcast. We just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's what I like about it. And I enjoy uh, Podmatch and I, lo I love the uh, you know, podcasting that we do. It's still on its infancy and amazing. And, and then kind of remembering that our podcast there, you are in New Orleans and I'm in Prince George, British Columbia. And, and uh, we are having a discussion as friends and, and, and develop this relationship. And the other thing to know about it, as you well know, that likely tens of thousands of people are watching our discussion that we have on so, such important issues around the world. And it's yeah. just amazing. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Joy, it was a pleasure what? and a privilege. Ah, oh, you're so sweet and your life is an inspiration. You're amazing. Thanks, Joy, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Take care.